how to take care of the welfare health point of view. So this disaster uh, is uh, also creating the economic impact on the region. So the, the uh, because of the damages which have taken place and because the people lose a um, lot of funds and uh, the jobs. So uh, there is a direct impact on the economy part as well. When we are talking of the disaster management part, uh, where uh, remote sensing, GIS, and uh, UAV technology can help. There are several steps, starting from the mitigation, uh, preparedness, response, uh, recovery effects. There are some steps which we take uh, at the time of disaster. There are some steps which we take after the disaster has taken place. As you can see from this particular slide here, uh, uh, it tells you know how the UAV activity uh, can be helpful to us in pre-disaster activity when the disaster has not taken place and during the disaster, how we manage it and after the post-disaster activity. So there are a lot of work involved during the disaster and after the disaster, the post-disaster activity. If we look at this uh, management cycle, in the management cycle, uh, uh, there are uh, various important steps and uh, maybe you are aware somebody might have already covered this, but in uh, when we are talking of uh, uh, the images, various uh, satellite images and GPS data, it is playing very, very important role here. You know, when the disaster strikes, then rescue and relief becomes the most important part for anybody. So uh, the images can provide the true picture of the ground, a true situation of the ground in order to assess the amount of the damage, in order to find out which are the safest area where the people could be taken and uh, uh, what kind of a relief is required to be provided. Then, uh, you know, when the disaster has already uh, taken place, then uh, recovery part is important. You have to take them to the safe places. You have to find out the uh, shortest and the best route to transport them. Uh, maybe uh, the roads are damaged. It is disconnected with the road, so you have to airlift them. So there also these geo uh, uh, spatial technology are playing important role. Rehabilitation and reconstruction, it takes place after the disaster uh, has taken place. Uh, to actually find out what are the suitable sites, what are the best sites uh, for this rehabilitation and reconstruction. Uh, it should be uh, away from the fault, it should be away from the flood zone. So all that uh, one can do a very easily analysis in the GIS. Prevention is most important. Um, so how we can prevent the uh, or the disaster in the future. So we can probably minimize, we cannot completely eliminate that. So what are the different steps, structural, non-structural measures which one can take or whether we can develop some kind of a, a warning systems uh, using the latest geospatial technology, IoT and sensor. And then the next step is the mitigation part. So how to do the uh, mitigation with the disaster in case it is happening. And preparedness is again the uh, the next uh, last part of it, uh, which basically uh, gives uh, us some direction from the previous uh, disaster. So we get some steps, what are actions to be taken from the previous disaster. We uh, carry out the risk assessment also for from, from every disaster, it is important to carry out the risk assessment. So when we carry out the risk assessment, it could be uh, on uh, actual data, it could be in a simulated model. And uh, some of the data would come from, directly come from the remote sensing or, or, or GPS, land use and land cover. Various uh, infrastructures which are present, um, then we uh, use these data, create a land hazard zonation map. And this, when we create 
a hazard zonation map from any disaster. It is the integration of the ground data, socioeconomic data, and data about the infrastructures which are present on the ground and hazards donation atlases have been prepared by National Remote Sensing Center Hyderabad also. Now, uh, uh, mitigation measures are very important. You know, we know that the, we cannot minimize the, uh, totally eliminate the occurrence of the disaster, but we can certainly uh, minimize the impact of those. So there are some structural measures, there are some non-structural measures which uh, we can take. So under the structural measures, one can see that we can strengthen our buildings. So some people, uh, you know, will provide the earthquake bank to make them earthquake resistant, but it is uh, not just sufficient to make them earthquake resistant, but we have to see the effect of the cyclone, effect of the flood, effect of the earthquake, effect of the in winds strong winds can damage the buildings in certain area. So we have to see the combined effect and we have to design our buildings in such a way so that it can resist to more than one disaster. Then there are known structural measures. So these are like proper planning of the land use and land cover pattern. And we can control some of the activities in the high risk areas like the blasting activities. We can uh, plant more number of trees in the areas so that uh, uh, it can uh, protect it from, from the flood. So data becomes very important when uh, disaster takes place and uh, we feel that uh, this remote sensing data from various satellites, that's a very powerful data. That's a very useful data because Automatically, we will get the data after a few days of that same area. So we are not making any really any extra attempt for that purpose. And from the available satellites, the data is available to us at different resolution. So we will like, uh, like to actually see, uh, analyze the situation, and we will like to get first hand information from the satellite images directly then we can acquire the data from the other platform also. For example, in this slide, you can see that the bottom one is a ground-based system. So on the ground, either uh, we can install GPS systems which can monitor uh, the feature coordinates of a particular structure, or we can find out uh, deformation in the um, structures, or may have laser scanner, terrestrial laser scanner, where we can collect three-dimensional point cloud data from such devices. If we go little up from the uh, earth uh, to capture the data about the disaster activity, then it's a drone system, unmanned aerial vehicle system. And uh, the advantage of this system is that you can send it at any time uh, whenever the such activity uh, takes place and you get very, very high resolution images and data to carry out the analysis. Little up from that is the aerial photography. For aerial photography, taking to that area, uh, you need certain planning. Uh, but uh, aerial survey you must have seen is very, very common uh, in the disaster stricken area. Then we have the satellite images. So various satellites, Indian satellites, American satellites, Canadian satellites, you know, they are providing us the data at different resolution, uh, at uh, different coverage scale. So we can use this, uh, all the data, we can integrate the data together, we can take some information from the some data, or other information from the other data. So this is what we call as the uh, fusion of the data from multi-platform. So when we are doing that, this table shows that we have four kinds of a data with us, satellite data, aircraft data, drone data, and through the land survey. We have certain advantages of that data, and there are certain disadvantages which are listed in the second column and the third column. 
if we are talk about the satellite images we are getting very wide coverage of the area we can see the bird side view of the whole area and we can get the data at some repeated interval automatically aircraft would require certain flight planning but we get a better resolution than the satellite image the drone which is flying at a much lower altitude uh, you can actually have the data uh, as and when required very high resolution 1 cm per pixel so when we are talking of 1 cm per pixel so that means any object which has 1 cm dimension can be identified so we can identify each and every building irrespective of their characteristics irrespective of their type irrespective of their orientation then this uh, advantage of the drone data is that this is unaffected by the cloud cover because it is uh, hovering at a lower altitude so you don't get the cloud cover many times during the disaster activity you have the cloudy uh, weather so uh, that limitation is also gone here and it is very cost effective and safe you can send it to any dangerous area um, in the forest fire in case of a landslide in case of a earthquake damage where it is not possible actually to go by road or by any other means then surveying data if we are talking about we are getting very high accuracy positional accuracy from this data is very high so all the data which is listed over here has some uh, limitation also so you need some kind of expertise actually to carry out uh, the analysis and maybe you can club the data merge the data from two or three or four sources together in order to derive the best information when we are talking of the geospatial technology how the technology has grown when we are talking of the data collection about the land surface uh, we have uh, five uh, last five year we have the five quantum jumps in the technology from electronic distance meter to total station then we came to the uh, robotic total station then gps and the laser scanner so any kind of mapping including the building mapping or urban planning we were using all these devices to carry out mapping of these area but the sixth quantum jump which has taken place recently in geospatial technology is the unmanned aerial vector which we call as popularly as a drone if we uh, see what is the role of the uh, remote sensing data for disaster management as a whole so um, there are two clear cut activity one is the pre disaster and one is the post disaster activity so if we see uh, one role is here in the box which is the pink color uh, letter preparedness so we have to use this technology to uh, make uh, ourselves prepared in case uh, the the uh, disaster take place our response time should be very very less because then in that case every second matters then the second part is the prediction part so can we predict let us say the earthquake can we predict the flood can we predict the landslide the answer is uh, well um, we can do some of these uh, to a, a greater accuracy flood or probability of the landslide you know the probability of the earthquake is still uh, very poor while we are predicting the uh, occurrence of the earthquake but we can do that and there are a lot of work research work going on how this prediction could be improved we can predict the the uh, kind of a uh, you know tornado or uh, similar kind of activity which are hitting the coastal area right so we have forecasting models and we have the data from the satellite then a post disaster will be the relief so in order to provide the relief uh, immediately this data has to be analyzed almost in real time and uh, government is interested to know how much is the amount of the damage and uh, when relief has to be provided which are those pockets and how much is the financial involvement of the government so that 
all uh, action plan it can be generated with the help of the geospatial tools. Then last part is the recovery part. You know, once uh, the disaster has taken place, it will have to be re rehabilitated and then uh, they are brought back to the normal life. Uh, we use uh, satellite images to collect various kind of information uh, for the affected area. We have a poor resolution satellite data, AVHHR mode is where the resolution of the data is of the order of one kilometer. So one pixel size is one kilometer. So here uh, probably it is impossible to see uh, the townships, the buildings in the area. Uh, because of the poor uh, resolution. But if we go down the lane and you can see that there are commercial systems at the bottom and these commercial systems are providing me uh, very high resolution images uh, from one meter to five meter. At present we have commercial satellites which can provide me image at 35 centimeter resolution. So I can't miss those small, small feature. I can't miss and the, uh, the buildings, the flats, the residences, and the other uh, habitated areas. We can uh, carry out the mapping of that. Uh, if we see the Landsat, Aster image or MISR image, they are the medium resolution image. So there are applications which are covering a large area, let us say the floodplain region, uh, floodplain uh, uh, region of a uh, river. So then in that case, I will go for the medium resolution satellite image. Uh, if we look at the last column, which shows the global coverage, uh, I, I can get the global coverage every two days or every single day from this uh, poor resolution data. So the whole of the earth is covered uh, very frequently. And if you again go down the lane, then you can get actually uh, the global coverage but after certain interval of time. So there are disaster activities uh, which are sudden in nature and then we have to actually monitor the area, carry out the assessment of the damage uh, maybe every day almost or maybe twice a day. But there are studies where uh, we have to uh, use this data which is available from the satellite every 16 days and every 14 days because there will not be much change uh, every day on the ground. So all the data are important to us provided uh, it depends upon you know what kind of a disaster applications we are using. This example is showing us the uh, tsunami activity which has taken place in the year 2004 in our country and this is the trinket island area. So this is a, a uh, you know, you can see a lot of vegetation cover which is appearing uh, red and uh, orange color uh, on the island. Uh, very uh, dense vegetation cover because you get very good uh, red color here which indicates the good amount of vegetation cover on the uh, surrounding area, in the surrounding area, you can have the color of the water. So, just immediate surrounding is the lighter color, and if you go away from the island, it is a dark color tone. So, this is indicating that due to the human activity, the water is not as clean and as pure as you go outside. But when um, this uh, tsunami took place, uh, you can see the images uh, 26 December 2004 when the tsunami hit the uh, Ireland, a uh, lot of muddy water is there. So it, you, you don't have as clean water as it is in the left image and it has entered into the land area and created a lot of damage uh, not only to the land vegetation cover but to the human being also. So we can we can find out how much is the loss uh, due to the earthquake when we are talking of the pre and the post uh, images. This is uh, uh, the uh, damage again, damage assessment from the satellite image in Uttarakhand area 
when the when a lake busted in the area so there were several uh, important uh, areas and chardam places which were basically damaged a lot of people have flown into the area a lot of buildings were collapsed and uh, debris were flowing all through the river so that kind of a damage was done with the help of the satellite image that one can identify so this is a pre you know prior to that you can see uh, the channel very good shape of the channel the habitated area and all that and this is uh, when the act, the activity has taken place when there was a burst of this channel then a lot of water has gone in the downstream area and created damage so one can actually carry out first hand study with the help of such images because the government is interested to provide immediate relief to save the people and to provide them life saving drugs medicines as well as the essential items food items so these uh, techniques the satellite data can actually uh, be used to carry out this kind of a preliminary analysis and gps will give us the coordinates of the locations which are the critical location you can identify with the help of the gps now when the disaster takes place uh, the ambulances are playing important role the hospitals are playing very important role uh, because lot of people are injured or they are, are almost dead or they need immediate attention medical services so uh, all these ambulances are actually fitted nowadays with the gps devices so gps will give you the coordinate and high resolution satellite image based map in the gis so it's a combination of gis image processing as well as the gps through which this ambulances can reach to any place any location and uh, uh, can uh, find out the shortest route actually to take the patient quickly to the hospital measurement of the landslides so landslides you know they are one of the biggest uh, disasters in the hilly regions for example in uttarakhand only the last night there was a very big landslide in pithoragar region and it has created again lot of damage to the buildings to road to the river to bridge and uh, to the local people and the tourist you know they are all cut off from the uh, both the sides because there is now the road is full of debris so one can actually carry out the measurement of the landslides with the help of the 3d scanner so this is a 3d scanner uh, which is used in geomatics engineering to create 3d model of the area to collect the data of this so from a distance uh, you can set up it from a distance and the range is Uh, available up to one kilometer, so you are safe with the instrument, with the device, and still uh, you are collecting the data for the activity. So prior to landslides and after the landslide or during the landslide, if we can actually collect three-dimensional data of this landscape with the landmass, you can find out how much is the landmass which has been removed from here and which has actually clog the river also we can find out the critical areas what are the critical areas uh, where some protection measures are to be taken so that there is no landslide in the future so these equipment are helping us now when we are talking of the landslide the first thing is the mapping of that and satellite images are playing very important role and there are various atlases as i told you national remote sensing center has prepared a very good atlas on uh, various kinds of the disasters which where uh, the uh, remote sensing gis and gps activities can actually provide us lot of important and useful data so this is uttarakhand state and 
this is the boundary which meets with the Nepal. So th there is a road here along the boundary and this is a very important road because this is actually uh, connecting the international boundary. So this is called Tanakur Lohagat Pithoragad Malpa route. And for this particular route, along this route, so that this route becomes all weather route, it is not obstructed by the landslide. A landslide hazard zonation map has been created. So you create the landslide hazard zonation map based on meteorological parameters, based on the topographical, geological characteristics, the land use, the slope. So all these parameters are taken into account and then you create this kind of a hazard zonation map all along the route. And you know that which are the areas where you have the severe landslide, for example, the land the red color is indicating the severe areas and very low susceptibility to landslide hazard is the yellow area. So we have now classification of the area from severe, very high, high, moderate, low and very low. So we have to certainly focus in those areas now where the severity of the landslide is very high so that this road becomes all weather road and it is not obstructed at any time because the landslide has occurred. There are many countries like if we take the example of the Hong Kong, it's a hilly country, but the uh, scientific measure, the technical measures have been taken in, in such a way that there is not even a single landslide which is obstructing the normal working of the people road is never blocked. So we have to similar kind of a uh, technique we have to adopt and technology um, we have to provide. So this is the, uh, these are the different uh, routes, maps which are shown you in bits and pieces over here. And this is the landslide has also nation. Now another big problem nowadays, which earlier did not exist is uh, the urban flood. So the slide which I am showing you is about the urban flood. Earlier it was only river flood. The area which were close to the river in the vicinity of the river in the flood plain of the river were affected whenever there is a water. But today what we see is that uh, if there is a little intense rain in a particular area that rainwater will actually flow all through the urban region, the habitated region, and will enter into the buildings and will start now damaging the road, the infrastructure, the buildings. Many buildings are collapsed because of the flood water which has damaged the foundation of the building. So it is not just the earthquake which will damage the building, but the other form of the disasters can also do that. So this is a uh, 3D representation on the left. This is the 3D representation of the ground where you can see the blue is the water feature which is entering into the low lying area, particularly where there is a heavy, very dense vegetation cover. If you see on the right side, a little blow up, the buildings are shown in their third dimension with their actual height. So one can also find out from this kind of a modeling submerged area, how much uh, area will be submerged up to what depth the building will be submerged in case of the rainwater which flows through the area. So urban flood has really become a big problem it is occurring in Ahmedabad, it is occurring in Mumbai, it is occurring in Delhi, you know, in many cities, whenever there is an intense rain, because the rainfall pattern has also changed, and uh, probably we are not so careful about the land slope, and uh, because of that, or and sometimes our drainage system is choked up. It has not been cleaned before the rainfall. So there are several reasons and because of that, 
we find difficulty. So we can carry out uh, a, a hydrodynamic modeling. It's not static modeling, but a dynamic modeling. You know, this water is continuously flowing to the area. So when it is one meter depth or when it is 0.5 meter depth, how much will be the damage to this particular area? Which area will be submerged? Which area will be safer? So we can see from the left hand um, slide here also that this is the region which is quite safe. Uh, there is no water entering into that particular region. So from rehabilitation point of view, uh, you know, we have to find out the best site, suitable site uh, where rehabilitation could take place. Now this is about the Kosi River. Kosi River is flowing through the Bihar and uh, it is uh, damaging large amount of the area in Bihar every year. It's a recurring flood which is uh, occurring in the Kosi River and it is shifting. The river is also shifting its course. So from sequential satellite images, you know, we, we will definitely like to see how much is the spread of the flood, what are the losses which are taking place in the area and which are the critical spots where we can have some kind of a structural measure. So in 2008, there was a heavy flood in this and this is, these are the different satellite images as you can see on the top. Uh, the dates are changing. So these are the different dates, uh, satellite images which were taken and the uh, water pixel, the area affected by the flood water, they are identified, superimposed them together and some kind of animation has been created. So these kind of animation when you create in the image processing or a GI software is helpful to understand. It gives us more understanding um, um, to know that uh, which are the uh, areas, how much is the spread of the area uh, which is damaged by the flood water. This is a uh, 3D visualization of the flood. So when there is a normal water, uh, the river is flowing and when there is a flood in this particular river, then you can see the area which has the lower slope. So this is the uh, opening where the flood water would enter and would like to spread in the area. But still there are some areas which are safer areas where the uh, flood water will not touch the land surface. So we have to identify two things that which are the safer areas for habitation construction. Number two is that wherever the water is entering first, can we plan some kind of a protection measures? Can we plan some kind of a blockage of the water there so that the water flows smoothly and it does not spread into the surrounding land. So we can create all these animations into the GIS environment and they are very, very useful to uh, make the administration understand. Administrator will not understand the, the technical equation or the algorithm which they have used. They will understand the final result. This is a, a, a Dehradun area which I am showing you. It is the capital of Uttarakhand. And uh, this uh, left side is the three dimensional view of Dehradun and the surrounding area. This uh, colored map, what you see in the center of the satellite image is the municipal boundary. And each municipal boundary has a ward number of wards. So number of wards in the municipal boundary, they are shown by different colors. So this particular ward, you can actually, uh, you know, this municipal area, you can carry out the mapping of each and every building. And uh, uh, you can carry out some kind of a simulation study that if in case there is an earthquake of that much intensity, that much richer scale, what will be the damage to the area? How many buildings are likely to collapse? How many buildings are likely to develop just the cracks? It will not collapse completely, but it will be partially collapsed. 
how many buildings will remain intact so we have to collect lot of lot of data about each and every building so this uh, is a satellite image on which the boundaries are marked and you can see on one satellite image this building map has been created buildings are shown with their true heights so when you are showing the building with the true height this data will come from the ground and we are using in geomatics engineering the equipment like total station uh, where we can actually find out the height of the different structure so by knowing the height of the different structures and uh, by knowing their geographical locations we can create this kind of a three dimensional map in our uh, gis environment now we can find out in case there is an earthquake in the area with uh, a defined intensity and duration we can also find out that which buildings are likely to collapse so you can see the different colors are there so different colors are indicating the red one will completely collapse this will partially collapse and this will also have damage into but the brown buildings will remain intact so you require now not only just the high data but what you require for each and every structure and building uh, the characteristics of this particular building what is the material used how much is the um, iron use saria use in that building whatever the design of that building so all that parameters are very important age of the building so that data or are, are collected and you carry out some kind of a simulation modeling so when you are preparing the map of the buildings you have to do some kind of a categorization also whether it is a residential building or say commercial building or it's a hospital or it's a school or it's a recreational building or it's a government office or it is a hotel you know categorization into different categories you can do and then you can enter the characteristics of the each building in your database and then you can find out what will happen in case of the earthquake you can also find out you know this study shows road which will be blocked by the building collapse today we have high rise building so one high rise buildings will fall onto the another high rise buildings and will damage that also and also the ultimately the debris will ultimately come on the road so it will block the road so that means the movement the passage you cannot really commute from one place to another because of the blockage of the road in case of the earthquake so you can also carry out a similar kind of a study which you can see from here that some of the roads are very clear to you where some of the roads like this where i am uh, putting my cursor here these roads are completely damaged so that means you cannot provide the relief at the other end by uh, road you need some kind of a other Uh, you know helicopter or other devices in order to provide the relief and food etc you can also develop early warning system you know people are uh, developing these early warning systems so that we can minimize the impact of uh, these disaster and geomatic tools are playing very important role in developing the early warning system so lot of data is required and lot of communication lot of sensors it people they are all involved so when we are talking of the seismic kind of a hazard and then gps is playing very important role if we want to develop a, a system for earthquake then gps basically is very sensitive to the displacement a millimeter displacement will be recorded by gps so uh, in our country also in the entire himalayan belt and in the coastal region uh, these gps have been fitted and these gps is are continuously taking the data and they are providing 
and transmitting the data to a central station where monitoring activity is going on. Whenever there is a small change in the coordinate system, so that means the landmass has moved from its original position. So some kind of a warning could be developed. It could be a tsunami, it could be earthquake related warning and so on. This slide is showing you that, you know, how these GPSs are installed. So one GPS here, another GPS there, the third one there, the fourth one is here. So a lot of combination of those GPS all along the different earth crust mass plates which are moving or the thrust line. So we like to monitor whether this gap is widening or there is a, a movement of the plate. Uh, so that minute change in the coordinates can be determined with the help of the GPS system and can be used for developing the warning system. Now, when we are talking of uh, the earthquake uh, early warning systems, so this is a complete diagram where uh, we are collecting the data and then we are using some sensors which are working in the S wave and the P waves recording. And then this data will go to the entire um, this earthquake uh, uh, central place, which we call it the earthquake alert center. And depending upon the threshold value, this uh, earthquake alert center will actually give the warning to the people in the surrounding region. So that's how this entire system is working. And many countries uh, actually are uh, working in this direction to develop a perfect uh, system, but we do not have uh, right now a very perfect system for earthquake. We have developed a system for flood. We have developed a system for, uh, you know, if uh, there is a, some kind of a, um, a tsunami uh, or some kind of a activity which is hitting the uh, landmass, strong winds which are hitting the landmass. So we can develop uh, well in advance the warning system. But in earthquake, actually, the time lag is very important. And by the time, you know, we try and analyze the data and we get all the data, hardly two, three seconds are left. And it is really become, it really becomes impossible to give warning to the people in this two, three seconds time. So this is a complete system, you know, which is the, how the system is communicating with each other and, and try to issue the warning. Uh, related to the seismic earthquake activity. So there are lots of uh, GPS, uh, there are other satellites, uh, and then there is a warning center, and there is a station which is actually communicating with all the devices together. And then on the basis of the resultant data, this center takes the decision. Drones are playing very important role actually in collecting the data related to our surface, whether it is disaster activity or it is any other activity. So drone is a, a remote control pilot less aircraft. There is no pilot sitting on it. There's a remote on the ground and you are controlling the movement of their drone with the help of that remote control devices. So it is flying without people and it really cannot carry actually that much weight also of the people. So the best advantage is when it, uh, something is flying without people, we can send it to the dangerous area. And that is why, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, applications in the army. When we are talking of the war, it is no more now uh, physical war from person to person. We are sending the drones with the ammunition and, and trying to damage the infrastructure of the other country. Now, if you uh, look at the uh, technical names of the drones in the literature, you have unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, technical term, unmanned aerial system, UAS. It is also known as a remotely piloted aircraft system, RPAS. But most popularly in layman language, it is called drone. You must have seen this drone in uh, functions, various function, birthday party or the marriage party. If we see the timeline, you know how the 
technology the drone technology has developed over a period of time so uh, you can see right from the 2006 and then continuously there are developments in the drone technology and we are using now it for very large number of applications initially it it was thought that it will be uh, only useful in military application but there are large number of civilian application there are large number of industries which have come up and doing their business with the help of the drone so if we see the applications here very large number of applications are there in the aerial photography is the maximum we take the photograph we try to analyze we carry out the mapping what we identify the feature from that then we have traffic monitoring and management application in that area then environmental analysis agriculture mapping surveillance is another big area uh, where drones are used to uh, do the surveillance of the border area the coastal surveys film and media the entertainment industry is also using the drone law enforcement the police department and law enforcement agencies are using it then it is used in the disaster management to actually take the images during the disaster after the disaster uh, and carry out the analysis of both the images then delivery of the goods and delivery of the medicines so these are some of the application but there are very large number of application of the drones in the, the advantages when we are using them for um, disaster application or some other applications uh, it has high speed of the data capture so you can capture the data with a very greater speed you require less number of people you get more data points because when you are mounting a lidar system onto that you get millions of millions of points point cloud data whose coordinates are known to us we get very high efficiency because the data collection is much faster the best part of this is the safer you know you uh, uh, don't have a human pilot in there so you can send it to those dangerous area it is Uh, considered to be the safe because there is no loss to the human life in case it is damaged also so very very high resolution images we can get up to 1 cm any any object any building any infrastructure which is as small as 1 cm can be detected can be identified we can carry out the 3d modeling 3d modeling of the landscape 3d modeling of the township 3d modeling of the building infrastructure it is not affected by the cloud as in the case of the satellite images we get cloud cover because many times whenever some disaster activity is taking place the sky becomes cloudy so we have lots of lots of cloud we don't have the clear image of the ground and we have to wait certain number of days in order to get the clear image but we can send the drone to the area and it flies at a low altitude and it will take all those bright and crisp images which are cloud free high temporal resolution means as and when required we can send it to the area and take the images and also the low cost technology now if we classify them what are the two different type of drones and what are their uh, you know different applications so we have two types of drones here the fixed wing drones are there like looks like the aircraft and other is the rotary wing of drones so here we have the uh, in this case we have the four rotary in case of a fixed wing drones you know they can fly much much faster actually and their flying time is more but they require a small runway so you need a ground space where it, uh, it can run to a certain distance and then take off uh, Uh, similarly while it is landing but the rotary wing type is uh, you can, it can fly vertically up so maybe you need just a small piece of the ground uh, where you keep it and it can go vertically up and or you can actually fly it from your rooftop so when we see rotary wing types of the drones then there are again further subdivisions sub categories of the first one is for example quadcopter quadcopter means the four 
there are four rotary wings in this. Then the second category is the hexacopter. We have the six wings there. And the third category is the octacopter. There are eight wings. In fact, there are many other categories, but these are the popular one. And out of the three, the quadcopter is the most popular. Actually, you will find that this is very frequently used world over because of its advantage, because of its flexibility. You don't require a runway. You can uh, fly it from your rooftop. Now, these drones are classified by weight also. So there are drones which uh, will weigh small drones, 25 kg. Uh, military drones will cost, actually will uh, be very, very heavy. Then you have micro uh, drones, which are about 2 kg in weight. Then you have uh, drones, which we call as the model drones, racing drones or toy drones. In the toys also, the drones are available but they don't provide you that high accuracy. So when we are talking of the, what kind of a range the drones are available, they are available in 50 kilometer range or 200 kilometer range, they can go and collect the data. Flying time, you know, flying time uh, is also important when we are using it. Some drones will fly up to 30 minutes only, and then the battery will be exhausted. Some drones can fly up to 10 hours and then you have to maybe charge the battery or replace the battery. Weight wise also they are ranging from less than 5 kg to the 5000 kg weight. And those are used for military purpose. Speed 60 km per hour to approximately 500 km per hour. Altitude, they can go up to 6 km altitude, up to 16 km altitude. So depending upon our application and the utility, we will go for a particular type of a drone. We have large drones. You know, um, they look like a, a big size helicopter or, big, or a small size aeroplane. But uh, they are very powerful. Uh, their speed is very high. They can carry a lot of weight and they are used mainly for military purpose. They are the medium kind of drones. So the, uh, they are not as long as you see the previous one. But again, we are not using the medium. We are using uh, for our mapping purpose, for our data collection purpose. We are using these small drones. So these the small drones uh, are uh, flown to the area and they are collecting the data. Then we have the micro drones also available. If we look at the uh, anatomy of the quadcopter, what are the different components of it? Uh, it's, it is important for us to understand because um, these components are playing very important role when you are flying to the area and you want to collect the data. So we have, for example, uh, there are various uh, uh, alphabets right from A to I, you will see. So there are propeller which will actually move clockwise or anti-clockwise and provide the thrust to the UAV or drone system to go vertically up. And similarly, uh, in opposite direction, if we do that, you know, left movement and the right movement, or it will come down. So this one has to learn climb. Then we have uh, the imaging system. So here, here we have the camera system. It could be a multispectral camera. It could be thermal infrared camera. It could be hyperspectral camera. So various kinds of camera are available, which could be utilized. Then these quadcopter can also use LIDAR systems where you have the point cloud data because the LIDAR uh, scanners are a little heavier than the camera system. So one has to cross check before you buy the uh, drone system, whether it is capable to take that much of load up in the air. Then there's a battery pack, which is important because you have to replace the battery maybe after 
half an hour once it has collected the data then we have the front indicator light you know this is a symmetrical uh, body when it is up in the sky you never know which side is the front so there is an indicator bulb and which will actually uh, indicate you know off and on it will indicate uh, it will blink so we know that this is the front side of the drone and you can give forward motion backward motion left and right motion so you can fly to the area and collect the data but you have to take the permission so in every country uh, there is a aviation authority so dgca is authority in our country you have to take the permission from them you have to register your drone with them and then uh, once you have the trained uh, pilot then you are authorized actually to fly to the area so one has to see you know what are the regulations where you cannot fly where you can fly for example the regulations are you cannot fly right now above 120 uh, meter above the earth surface you can fly as long as the drone is visible it should not be invisible to you you cannot fly drone in military establishment you cannot fly drone near the airport 5 km near the airport so there are different regulations are there when you are flying the drone and trying to collect the data so this is the air space classification which is important for us to understand because it, your drone should not collide with the existing uh, air systems where already there are some aeroplane there are some helicopters which are moving at different different altitude so this is class a is the highest altitude but class g is the lowest one where you are permitted to fly the drone systems it has a lot of applications various applications in various fields which are listed over here uh, but the for you the important could be urban development you can do the city survey because uh, with the traditional surveying equipment you cannot carry out the traditional uh, with this the surveying because of the obstruction because of the traffic on the road because of the uh, high rise buildings which will obstruct your visibility so one can carry out the mapping of the entire city area with the help of the drone system and when i talk about the disaster management you can get real time data from that you can use this for search and rescue operation there are many many examples where uh, during the disasters you know the people have disappeared either they are uh, you know buried uh, under the debris or you know they uh, are actually lost somewhere uh, in the flow of the water so the search and rescue operation is very important and another important uh, activity of this is uh, delivery of the essential items so this for example the covid 19 pandemic is also considered medical disaster and here everybody needs medical help everybody needs medicine everybody needs food also so drones have played very important role actually delivering the essential items delivering the uh, life saving drugs to the uh, remote area and delivering the bloods now when we are talking of the drones sometimes they are used in groups not just one but a group of drones and we call it swarm of drones s w a r m swarm of drones means that uh, several drones are communicating with each other and they are flying to uh, some area covering large area collecting the data very very fast so if you want to collect the data very fast of a large area then we have to use swarm of drones here internet of things is playing very important role because these drones are also communicating with each other there is no collision in between also there is a perfect coordination of these drones when they are collecting the data first and most 
important use of this drone data is surveying and mapping. So a uh, lot of area you can collect the data uh, in third dimension and then you can use the data for creating a contour map, creating a digital elevation model, creating a point cloud data. So you can have lots of lots of options when you are collecting the data. These are the images. When you have the uh, photographic camera mounted on it, you will get uh, such images. And if you collect the images in a stereo mode, like these are the two stereo images, you can see the building here. You can see the same building on the next photograph. So there is an overlap between the two. And this is what we call a stereo image. We can create a 3D model of the building using these images. We can uh, carry out thematic mapping, we can carry out topographical mapping, or we can carry out very specific mapping like uh, for buildings. If we want to map the buildings, we want to map only the infrastructure in the area. That all you can carry out either a digitization process you will use, or you will use some kind of an automated process, image process. To extract the useful information from the data. Now, uh, in traffic management, also, this drone is helping us a lot. So, sometimes uh, on the road, also, there are disastrous activities, and particularly when the accident takes place. There is a, uh, you know, two uh, vehicles collide with each other, and suddenly there is a fire vehicle caught fire or in foreign countries one vehicle when collide with the other vehicle then there are behind there are also vehicles which are moving with the same speed so they will also collide it is not one to one collision as in our country it is one to many collision so these drones which are flying at the different altitude you know they are keeping a track of the distance also so they uh, would like actually to uh, take all that details of the registration number of the vehicle also in case somebody is flouting the traffic rules. So they keep on giving the warning to the people, beeps to the driver and help in managing the traffic. This slide shows that, uh, you know, the different roles of the drones. So here uh, there's a drone which is flying over the highway and uh, it is monitoring the traffic on the highway. Then there is a drone here which is monitoring the infrastructure. So there are several infrastructures uh, which develop cracks over a period of time. So monitoring the crack, monitoring the deformation in the high rise buildings, that all can be done with the help of the drone technology. So there's a drone here which is actually collecting the data from the security point of view. Then there is a drone here, which will respond to the disaster in case some disaster activity is taking place. It will immediately respond. Then there is a drone here, which will actually monitoring the agriculture, forestry and the fishes activity. There are drones here, which are delivering the items, which are carrying the transport, which are carrying the goods with them. So different roles are there in the urban environment. This is a 3D model which you can create from the data collected by the drone in case uh, there is some disaster activity and the building is damaged. So this building, you can see the front part is damaged while the back part is more or less intact part. But there are some windows also which are damaged due to the earthquake activity. So you can create uh, a 3D model pre and post and then calculate how much is the uh, damage uh, taken place in this particular building. The people have actually also carried out the estimation how much cost will be required if the entire building is to be reconstructed or a part of that is reconstructed. Not only that, people have also identified 
if we have to paint this building the outer surface of the building how much paint would be required and what will be the cost of that painting now surveillance of the border is uh, another area because a lot of terrorist activities takes place or a lot of illegal activities uh, take place along these border regions so the surveillance can be done uh, with the help of the drones because it can stay at a point for a longer time or it can move also along the border lines so those areas which are very very difficult by the human being to carry out the surveillance it can be carried out with the help of the drones in the night uh, the uh, infra thermal infrared cameras would help us identify the people if they are crossing the border now uh, essential items supply and drop with the drone has become a very well known application very important application we have seen it and general public has seen it during the covid 19 period also so now it has become a very very important tool in case of the flood in case of the cyclone in case of the earthquakes immediate relief has to be given to the people people will require uh, first aid they will require some food items immediately so that can be delivered with the help of the drones even to the remote area so world health organization has also identified drone as one of the best tool actually to serve the people essential items so drone is helping us in healthcare sector also supplying life saving drugs and essential medicine this is one example in rwanda where drones have been successfully used because in rwanda uh, we do not have very good medical facilities very good uh, medical help to the people those who are living there so in case uh, you know they need immediate um, those medicines or immediate blood if there is no blood bank in the area then the supply of the blood is also done with the help of the drones so this is you can see that at the bottom the box which is carrying is basically those essential medicines which are transported from one place to the another place another disaster which has sometimes taken place due to the fault electric fault or overheating some of the components so you can see here in the power line uh, you know uh, the drone is flying near to the power line and trying to inspect the power line is intact or not and if there is some defect which is being developed in some parts so that can be detected well in advance because before it becomes the disastrous activity so during the night time also the thermal vision cameras are provided and they can detect the rise in temperature or if there is any spark in the wire you know they can very easily catch that now there are lot of emergency services uh, where drones are playing very very important role so it could be maybe the accident it could be the fire it could be the terrorist activity where immediately the medical help is required so it's playing very important role police has identified this as a very important tool for enforcing the law at different places because it may not be possible Uh, at every nook and corner that uh, the policeman is keeping an eye so this drone keeps on moving into the area and then it will uh, definitely issue the warning of the people uh, those who are breaking the law during the covid time also when it was a complete lockdown many countries have used drone system uh, to give warning to the people those who are moving out on the road without any purpose disaster activity so any disaster which is taking place very first thing would be that you can carry out the mapping of the area with the help of this device so this is during the earthquake disaster the drone uh, is flying to the area and uh, taking the images of the entire area to have the real scenario of the area 
and because you know what happens is once uh, there are damages to the infrastructure to the buildings then there are a lot of insurance claims also afterwards any disaster activity there are insurance claims so insurance companies are also interested to know whether it is a false claim or it is a real claim and they wanted to know the actual damage which has taken place so they uh, are taking help of the uav and trying to assess the amount of damage and settle the claim as early as possible so uavs are helping us for preparedness for the future what ever lessons we are learning from the past they are helping us to prepare for the future response time response time should be quick this is very important in case of a disaster so we should have a technology which can provide us real time data which can analyze the real time data and which can give us real time results so drone is responding actually to all these situations and as you found to be very very important tool recovery recovery is also very important that recovery should be as fast as possible and people uh, should actually start their normal life again and here the drone and remote sensing images and gis basically is identifying the safer places so that they don't have similar kind of situation in the future if they were in the flood plain earlier they should not be resettled in the flood plain they should be resettled in the safer area now mitigation we can minimize we cannot completely eliminate that so for mitigation purpose also uav images are helping the administration and the authority search and rescue operation is very important whenever some disastrous activities are taking place we will have to see that there should be minimum loss of life to the people so there is a lot of rubble lot of debris which is actually uh, flowing or uh, lying into the area see this drone is helping us in the search and rescue operation uh, when people tourist you know they are going for uh, rock climbing activity or maybe uh, you know they jump into the river sometimes accident happens and the search and rescue operations are done with the help of the drone system so drone in and uh, is providing us uh, a kind of emergency response system it helps us in detection in helps us in analysis it also helps us in taking the proper action people have found that it is reducing the response time by 44% and which is uh, quite a lot which is very encouraging because when some disaster has taken place when some very emergent situation has come then even one second matters a lot because it is a question of life and death of the people hot spot detections you know the areas which are prone to forest fire or fire uh, industries which are prone to fire can be detected with the help of the uav because we can use here thermal infrared camera which can sense the temperature so uh, whenever there is a forest fire same thing in uttarakhand also in the month of may june uh, we find this uh, fire activities which have taken place um, in the forested area then uh, we have uh, the drone technology which can go closer to the actual spot and find out how much is the spread of the fire in which direction the fire is spreading how much the damage has taken place and what are the action plan steps to stop it so for planning and strategy purpose also we are using these drone they are providing us very very helpful images 
collected during the disaster. These are the you know swarm of drones, a group of drones who are collecting the data during the flood in the river. So if there's a flood in the river, uh, it has damaged the surrounding area. So taking a stop of that is done. So this can see, you can see here that um, the flood water has entered into the habitated area, which I call it the urban flood now, and some of the buildings uh, are submerged and area, the, the, the water has entered into the buildings and uh, some buildings might collapse also because uh, it will reach to the foundation level. So drones are actually providing us all kind of damage data, all kind of fair, real situation data. So what we say is the true picture of the ground. Uh, so it is a permanent record of the ground in terms of the photographs. So this is a mission matrix which shows that if we are using the drone, what kind of sensors could be used? The third column shows here what kind of a sensors we could use for various disasters. So first column here is a general mapping purpose, earthquake management or fire management. These are the type of the uh, sensors which we can use given in the third column. Then what are the capabilities once you collect the data, what you can do from that and what are the benefits which you can drive, they are given in the next column. So this uh, kind of uh, table will give us uh, uh, useful clue that what kind of uh, satellites and what kind of a sensor system we should select to be mounted on the UAV. So continuation of the slide says again the flood management, man-made disaster, search and rescue operation or weather related events, uh, what are the different kind of the sensors and what are the capabilities for uh, what applications we can use this data. This shows, this slide shows that uh, we have today lots of uh, new technology coming up. Can we integrate that technology into our geospatial data sets? The answer is yes. You can see the bottom layer is the user layer where user could be institution, a user could be a normal person, a user could be a government agency. Then we have the technical layer where uh, technical person will play a very important role in developing the algorithm, in developing the technology part. So under the technical layer, you can see here Internet of Things, cloud computing, big data, artificial intelligence. So all those latest uh, technology we can actually use along with the UAV data, in fact, to carry out many analysis. As you can see here, we can do route management, airspace management, flight data management, flight scheduling management, and also uh, we can use it for uh, UAV supervision and UAV industry services. Now, this data, UAV data, is uh, uh, not sufficient uh, alone. It is complementing the remote sensing data. So maybe we are using it along with the remote sensing satellite images and whatever information we cannot get from the remote sensing images due to its resolution, due to the limitation of the resolution. Or we cannot collect the remote sensing data every day from satellite images. So we can supplement that information from the UAV because it will give me a very high flexibility I can collect the data any time in a day or several times in a day, very, very high resolution and lower cost. Now, there are several challenges also of this technology. It's not that this technology has all the advantages which are listed in the first column, that there are advantages of the low cost and the low weight, and you can fly any time, you can map the area, monitor the uh, object but 
the challenges are limited flight time because of the battery will exhaust out after half an hour so you have to replace the battery limited by the weight it cannot carry very heavy weight up in the sky so you have to check when you are buying or using the uav how much payload it can carry it can carry more than one sensor but whether it is capable to carry or not that you have to see you cannot actually use it in a very heavy winds right limited amount of the appropriate software are available you have to buy the software in order to process the data so i can divide this challenges into three categories regulatory challenge technical challenge and weather so there are certain regulations that you cannot fly with uh, in certain zone you cannot fly at a certain height but there are technical challenges also involved there are technical challenges that the you need a pilot who is well aware of flying the drone uh, if you are using fixed wing you need a runway and multi rotor drones have limited flight time weather related challenges are if there is a rain heavy rain heavy wind heavy fog don't use this so there are certain things which might go wrong even after we have taken all the precautions um, error pilot error when you are actually uh, controlling it from the ground weather is too much of windy loss of communication if there is a loss of communication chances are the drone will be damaged then sometimes loss of communication means the drone will fly away and it will ret never return back to your destination loss of gps signals means that you will not get the exact coordinates of the data which you are collecting there are external considerations are there that means if uh, uh, there is an airport in the proximity then uh, you cannot fly a uh, pilot should be qualified you have to take the administrative approval and uh, collision with the eagles is also there sometimes there are big birds and eagles so uh, drone should not collide with those eagles and the birds otherwise the drone will get damaged now uh, if you look at uh, the global scenario global market of this particular technology and if you focus on the right slide the blue part is indicating the application in defense and the green part is indicating the application in civilian areas so this is the prediction of 2024 both the curves are rising whether we look at the blue curve or whether we look at the green curve so applications are rising but there are very very large number of application in the military field if we look at the investment which is done uh, in drone hardware manufacturing the drone for various applications worldwide so whether it is a government sector consumer sector or the enterprise sector the curve is on the rise itself now these uh, if we look at the uh, market potential of the drone or the revenues which are likely to be earned this is the prediction for 2025 so we are expecting that the the blue color is indicating indicating the drones which will be sold in thousands by 2025 and the green is showing the billion us dollar the kind of revenue which we are likely to earn from this technology so this indicate that there is a very good future uh, and application of this drone in uh, large number of fields so this indicate that by graph that we are using this drones in various applications so 20.7 is the real estate application 42.9 is just for taking the photograph and analyzing those photographs so the construction industry is the orange color which is 8.6% so several industry as i told you insurance company is now also using 1% is there so insurance companies are also requiring this ground truth data 
there are uh, new technologies uh, which uh, are coming up over a period of time and uh, we have to also use this technology like internet of things space based internet cloud platform big data simulation modeling all these have to be clubbed along with the uav data in order to get more accurate results in order to develop the early warning systems to the people in order to get the real time results so this is my last slide and which says that if we are using this uav technology for disaster related activity you know it can save a lot of life and property it is reasonably very low cost for disaster management they are used for creating the 3d model of the area uh, and uh, with that 3d model you can uh, actually find out the uh, correct estimate of the damage to these structures so they are very helpful as far as the planning and construction for the new settlement is concerned so uh, this is a book on introduction to unmanned aerial vehicle authored by me recently uh, this is the only book by indian author available in the market and this books actually gives more description of uh, the use of unmanned aerial vehicle or the drone for various applications and the future of the drone that's all this is uh, all about uh, my lecture anybody interested can ye pattern mein kyun nahi hai tumhara time table mein maangi lo participants uh, forum is now open for discussion uh, please uh, if you have any query after all this details uh, uh, we will be happy to interact participants any questions from participants yes i think sir uh, no uh, questions at present i think so okay um but sir, i have uh, i would like to uh, interact on this if time permits mm -hmm. sure so uh, what is the coming up for this drone uh, operations in india Uh, some for for the remit policy decision uh, or it is you are asking a question actually i think the your voice is broken so it's not clear to me okay so thoda I, i have some internet issue it present yeah. once so, am i audible uh, better yes. you are audible okay so sir is there any policy uh, required or do we need to follow yes. uh, take permissions for the run operations or directorate uh, of, yeah directorate hmm. of civil aviation in our country will give the permission actually what they do is you have to register your drone with them directorate of civil hmm. aviation and they will give you a id you know they will give you a code for your drone system and then they will check the papers also whether who is flying the drone the person has received some training or a certified pilot for flying the mm -hmm. drone and then uh, then you are permitted if you want to fly in a, uh, unrestricted area because there are certain restricted area if you are close to the military establishment Uh, you cannot fly if you are close to a big stadium where the game is being played you cannot fly 
if uh, there is an airport or there is a uh, defense establishment you cannot fly so there are certain area near the beach you cannot fly the uh, you know it, it uh, affects the privacy of the people so wherever uh, you know there are guidelines uh, uh, in somebody's courtyard you cannot fly the drone so mm. there are guidelines and one has to follow those guidelines while you are flying the drone and uh, very important thing is that suppose there is any damage any kind of damage from your drone to the public property or to a human being the person who is flying the drone is totally responsible we cannot say that we were flying first time we were beginner so there is no excuse actually it says that any loss which has occurred by your drone when you are collecting the data is entirely your responsibility so that is why the dgca is a little actually conservative in awarding or giving the permission uh, for people to fly you cannot fly for more than 120 meters you cannot fly the drone out of your sight drone should be visible to you you can go only that long so um, these limitations are restricting the use of the drone in our country but uh, you know there are certain restrictions which are common to other countries also but permission is required yes yeah. thank you thank you for enlightening now sir i would like to conclude this wonderful session and i was most looking forward to it i think many of the participants would have been so uh, since uh, today but everyone has food demand that we want the recording and uh, presentation so i think uh, maybe uh, they have uh, uh, left for now uh, but th they will be surely dis uh, discussing with you now okay. i would like to present a big vote of thanks for delivering such a intricate detailed presentation at this hour with such uh, full dedication and energy we are uh, greatly impressed each is sir uh, if i summarize uh, starting from application of gps gis then flood uh, landslide uh, or in all the disaster management area how to go for uh, gps surveillance how to map what are the applications uh, were amazing we everyone will certainly uh, be get interested in uh, going for research in this area particularly students then after when you have opened up a world of drones for us that vision unlimited like thing starting from then unlimited applications uh, how it can help in disaster uh, management and resilience then adding to it uh, how what are the challenges on all that details which you have given sir it was very impressive we are greatly uh, heartily thankful for sharing all this with us and uh, we had a wonderful time uh, and uh, literally cherishing this experience it was very 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 knowledgeable experience for all of us thank you very much sir once again for devoting your uh, precious time uh, at this hour going through the hassle for staying late for us with all your uh, more uh, duties it is totally we are uh, we humbly thankful to you having this opportunity thank you very much sir and, and i am really sorry that i do not know how no issue, sir. disconnected earlier and uh, uh, because of that uh, some of the participants might get tired uh, you know listening for the whole day um, but uh, 
definitely uh, those who have attended it uh, you know might get some idea how to use this particular technology uh, for making the building resilience to the disaster yes sir yes sir uh, and they will uh, watch out uh, the record even this topic uh, and sir yours as an identity looking to that uh, uh, in schedule uh, during uh, uh, his speech dr sorry mr pk tanija director general uh, gidm also uh, discussed uh, these are one of the uh, uh, impressive lecture and faculty you have clubbed then uh, our uh, gc modal sir principal sir and uh, uh, dr gm thank our everyone uh, uh, school out uh, looking to the faculty and town right and this was one of the most discussed topic so uh, and uh, after going through the recording they will uh, totally agree Uh, that uh, yes, it is a wonderful lecture to have you with us, and we will go for wide uh, dissemination of this lecture even in our civil engineering departments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and looking forward to the expansion. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I wish you all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.